And today's webinar is Black Oaks Revealed, a deep dive into their cultural significance for indigenous communities. And we are joined today by our presenter, Clint McKay. Uh, Pepperwood is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to inspire conservation through science. We are located in Santa Rosa, California, um, and the 3,200 acre preserve is home to a rich abundance of diversity. Over 900 species of plants and animals can be found there. We also have at the preserve the Dwight Center for Conservation Science, which is our facility where we normally host classes and events. Uh, we have a gallery space there in our offices. Uh, so we hope you can join us there in person someday in the future. Pepperwood's work can be categorized into three core areas. So we conduct research, um, long-term monitoring of our water, climate, wildlife, and plants. And we use this information to inform our stewardship of the land. And we also share it on a wider scale with our community. We have education programs such as the one you're part of here today um, and others for all ages from elementary school students to teens. Um, college students and lifelong learners. So thank you for joining us for learning today. And last but certainly not least is community. Our volunteers uh, contribute directly to our work through community science projects, um, stewardship and restoration projects. And of course we could not do this work without the support of our donors. So we're very grateful for all of you supporting us in these many ways. Thank you for being part of our community. And now I would like to introduce Clint McKay. So Clint is the descendant of several important local culture bearers that include the late Laura Fish Summersall and the late Mabel McKay. He is a native speaker of the Wapo language and he also speaks some Pomo and is himself a culture bearer with extensive native historical knowledge, not only of Pepperwood, but also of the entire region. Clint is a capable naturalist with a deep understanding of plant communities and traditional WAPO methods of nurturing them. He is a gifted basket weaver and has served as chair of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association for two terms. He is also a traditional WAPO spiritual leader and he is the headman of a traditional dance group. Clint McKay has a master's degree in indigenous education. And now I will pass it to you, Clint. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started with the land acknowledgement first, and then I'll start talking. Uh, oh. Got to get that thing off. Sorry. Okay. All right, so thank you all very much for joining us um, today. And please let us know if the audio, if my, if the sound is okay. Holland um, said she thinks it's yeah. fine. Um, Clint, I would like to chime in to say um, the view I'm seeing right now is your presenter view. It's not the full um, slideshow view. Okay. Uh, you may need to use um, up at the top of your window in the upper um, left corner, I see a button that says use slideshow. because right now we're getting a sneak peek. There we go. Perfect. Is that better? Yes. Okay. We're good. All right. Hey, it would not be a Zoom event uh, with Clint if there wasn't some technical glitch for, from my end. So anyway, thank you all. Um, I apologize if you hear a little traffic in the background. We're still doing some major renovation on our house. So every once in a while, you can hear a car or something go by. So um, I'll, I will try to speak up and... Um, uh, get us get us going here. 
come I can't see it. If I look up there, I'm going to be looking up at everything. So did that change anything, Holland, or is that still okay? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I would like to start by um, acknowledging uh, the WAPO people, and I know we're not all on Pepperwood this morning, obviously, um, but a lot of the work that I do uh, is at Pepperwood, and so they asked me to put together a land acknowledgement for a land acknowledgement for my people. And so, um, even though we're not on the land, I would ask everybody to just join me in this. Um, and it's Pepperwood Preserve sits within the traditional homeland of the Wapo people. We respect and honor past, present, and future generations of Wapo and their continued connection to this land. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather in this beautiful place and we give our respect to its first inhabitants. So, um, good. I think we're ready to move on, go to the next, go to the next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> as we get as we get started here today, know that this is uh, quite different for for me as well. Um, I'm not. I am not in the habit of standing up and talking to folks and saying, "Hold your questions." I would much prefer a, that we have a conversation instead of me stand up and, and lecture to folks. But um, given the constraints of, of the situation we're in right now, um, we'll do our best. So please, like uh, Holland said, feel free to put those questions out there and, and we will have time at the end um, to address whatever questions we can. So um, thank you, Holland, for that, for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate you folks taking time out of your busy day to come and spend it uh, with us and to allow uh, me to share a little bit about who I am, uh, where I come from, um, what, what Indigenous education and what the Black Oaks uh, mean to me and to my people. And I will point out um, before my next slide comes up, um, Holland said that I have a master's in Indigenous education and I do and I'm proud of the work and effort that it took for me to obtain that. Um, but as one of my uh, favorite professors told me that us as indigenous people, he said, you have a degree that's thousands of years old. And so I want you to understand this as I move through my first couple of, couple of slides. Okay, here we go. So a little bit about me and my beginnings. Uh, my parents are Floyd and Mary McKay. Um, I've almost 40, year, 40 years married um, to my lovely wife, Lucy McKay. Uh, I have three daughters. Um, I'm a papa to three granddaughters and one grandson. And the most fortunate thing for me is to have been raised in a traditional home and being surrounded by indigenous knowledge and people that carried a great deal of that. So, um, you know, this isn't something that I just, you know, woke up 10 years ago or decided to go to Arizona State University to acquire indigenous knowledge. It's something that I am truly blessed uh, to have been raised with from day one. And a lot of times folks ask, you know, when did you learn this? When did you learn that? Uh, when did you start doing this? And for me, it wasn't something, again, that you know, I just decided I'm going to start being Indian today. Um, I didn't know anything any different. It's just the way it was being raised in, in, our, in our home and, and with my family. And um, th that's not something that, that I boast about at all. It is something that I count my blessings for every day. Um, you know, with the, uh, with the tremendous loss in, in, in my people's culture, and a lot of indigenous languages and traditions and, and, and uh, practices have been severely compromised by colonization. Um, you know, my family certainly endured that as well, but we're very fortunate that we had that cultural continuity from, from my ancestors to, to, uh, to keep our tradition and our culture alive and, and healthy. So with that, um, these are the teachers that taught me much more than I ever learned. 
at Arizona State University. Uh, these are the true professors, uh, the keepers of our knowledge, of our culture, of our traditions, of our language, of our basketry, uh, you know, of our, of, our, of our food sources, of our stories. And to Native people, you know, stories are not, they don't mean what it means to the Western world a lot of times. Stories are how we keep our culture and tradition alive. When we tell stories of the animals and how we came to be, uh, that's, that's how it is. And uh, that's what we believe. So I just don't like people to be misguided by stories by thinking it's something fictional or something that's made up. It's just the way that we, that's how we carry our culture and our tradition. And that's how we pass it down from generation to generation. So I was very fortunate um, to uh, live right next door to Auntie Laura. I moved, moved my family to the Dry Creek Rancheria. Uh, I am an enrolled member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo and Wapo Indians in Geyserville. And uh, shortly after I was married, I moved my, my wife and, and my family and we lived right next door to Auntie Laura. And, uh, she was just um, an, an amazing teacher and she still teach, teaching us uh, today. So she was Dry Creek Pomo and Wapo, far more than a master weaver. Um, her accomplishments and accolades would take up this entire, uh, this entire presentation. Uh, my Auntie Mabel McKay is Cash Creek Pomo and Wintoon. She's a master weaver and a spiritual healer and the same. Um, what these two ladies accomplished in their time here in this world and, and on this earth far exceeds anything um, any of us could ever hope, hope to achieve. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they were the last uh, true carriers and our last link to what Auntie Laura used to call the early days and the ways that our people used to live when we lived more free and were able to live completely, um, you know, by our traditions and by our culture. Um, these two ladies knew that and they, and they, and they lived that. So um, again, Auntie Mabel taught us so much and she's still teaching us uh, every day. And then of course, there's my dad. And, uh, you know, my dad is the one that is responsible again for me being raised uh, the way I was for being brought up in a traditional home where our language was spoken, where our culture and traditions were carried on, you know, and again, it wasn't something that where dad would, you know, call us all around the table or something and said, and say, okay, here, we're going to, you know, do this Indian thing here today. It's just a way of life. Just like, you know, just like uh, in Western society, people grow up, you know, without people sitting down there and say, and, you know, saying, okay, today we're going to be this way and tomorrow we're going to be that way. It's just the way that we were raised and we didn't know anything any different. When I went to school, um, you know, I really didn't realize I was any different than, than anybody else because I've never mixed, whether it was school or work, I've never mixed my personal life with my professional or with my educational life. And so, um, and uh, my dad is still leading us and leading our family uh, in our in our ways and, and in our culture. So, okay. So on to our presentation. And I'm going to try to say this. I might need some help from Holland or somebody, but um, I believe this tree is called Quercus Kalagii. Is that right? All right. So I said it right. So that is the first... The first and last scientific name you'll hear uh, spoken today. Um, that's not the language that I speak, but that is the word that is, I guess, the botanical name, if that's what they call it, uh, for black oaks. So we have Quercus Kalagii, alias California black oak. And so as we, as the, these first few slides go through and we're looking at these, at these majestic trees, uh, please notice their surroundings and notice where they appear and how healthy and strong uh, um, they are 
in their environment. So I guess the more common name for this is California black oak. So in my world, we are looking at koti shohol. And that's our word, that's the WAPO word for black oak, for Quercus kalag kalagii. So I said it, maybe I said it twice now. Um, this is koti shohol. And that's three of our four grandchildren there in the front. Um, but this, this uh, tree is incredibly special, sacred, if you will, um, to my people. And so as we go through the presentation today, I want to try and express and explain the best I can why what some would view as, yeah, it's an oak tree, it's a big, beautiful oak tree, but why to me and my people, it, that connection and that feeling and that reverence for this tree runs much deeper than just, it's a beautiful tree. So I'd like to talk about the cultural connection of the Wapo and the Pomo to Koti Shoho. And it winds up, uh, you know, to put, it, to put it rather bluntly, it's lessons learned. And this is how indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing are transferred from one generation to the next. And for us, it's all about life lessons learned not necessarily sitting in a classroom. It's not, uh, you know, having homework and performing well on tests because that's not how my people measure teaching and learning and the amount of knowledge that someone carries. So for us to be so entwined in our natural environment, it has taken generations and generations of lessons learned by being on certain levels with the plants and animals within our natural environment. So today I'd like to touch on how Koti Shoho teaches and has taught for many generations my people when it comes to sustenance, territorial boundaries, rest and regeneration, respect and reciprocity, and how Koti Shoho helps root our people in tradition. So let's start with something that's very near and dear to my heart, sustenance. So here we have um, a deer and it'll be hard for me because when I talk with my family and people in my home, um, for the most part, I speak my language. So sometimes if I get to talking and my language just speaks out, um, just blurts out, just kind of go along with me here. but. So here, here we have a deer, and if you notice um, on the ground there in front of it, it is consuming a large number of acorns. The deer is something that's very um, special to my people, and we have a very special connection with it. Um, a lot of it comes from the deer itself, pro providing sustenance for my people. Uh, we remain today um, avid hunters, and uh, you know, we say that without, without apology. Uh, we're, we're, we're not apologetic for living our life and being who and what we are. And it's not like we're out there, you know, running these things down. Um, we believe that they freely uh, give themselves to us. So the deer is something, um, as far as meat goes, that has sustained my people for, for, since time immemorial, and it's still doing that today. So we learn from this animal you know, the foods that they eat were so connected to them are foods that we can consume as, as human beings as well. Another example here we see underneath oaks, underneath some black oaks there, uh, we, see, we see a family of black bears and they are consuming acorns. And so, we observe these, these are observations of our natural world that my people have made again since time began. And so we learn from them. Uh, we learn that now here's another animal that we identify closely with for power and strength and spirituality in the bear. 
and we try to mimic these animals the best that we can. So what you'll see and what I hope you understand as we go through these slides is that these are lessons that are taught to our, to our people and this is why we don't put ourselves above anything else. Um, so you can see here the black bears are um, hunting acorns. They also teach us that it's okay to climb trees and we do not only collect acorns that have fallen on the ground. So by watching our, our brothers and sisters uh, climb into trees to gather the freshest and what we call affectionately non-buggy uh, acorns, which are the ones that are not infested with worms or weevils or things like that. So again, we, we mimic the lessons that were taught and we send usually the young folks uh, up the trees with sticks and things. And when the acorns are loose in their cups and ready to fall, that means they're ready. So we send the younger ones up and they knock the acorns down so we know we're getting good fresh acorns hitting the ground. So this next one, uh, sorry, I almost said palich. Uh, this um, acorn woodpecker here, we see him uh, doing his gathering and taking, um, you know, taking food back to, to their family as well. This bird is very, very special to us and, and his red top knot um, goes in our, in our baskets. Uh, we use the feathers for our baskets, for our ceremonial regalia, for our dance regalia. Uh, we make belts and dance belts and things like that um, out of him. So once again, we're learning from animals that are, that are highly revered and regarded by my people. So there are several places on Pepperwood Preserve that look like this right here. And you can see um, the woodpeckers, the woodpeckers granary trees happening here. And so again, we watch and we learn how to do this. And this is why when we build our granaries, they're up off the ground, we don't build them on the ground. They're either separate structures that are up high uh, where they're protected or we make them out of hollow uh, parts of, the, of, of a tree, of a tree stump, something like that. But again, we're learning. Okay. And the last animal here is a squirrel and you can see um, the squirrel here um, enjoying, enjoying an acorn there. And then the next one. So you can see here that this is um, certainly more than just eating. This is a gathering time for them as well. You can see the squirrel here has more than one acorn that it's holding and that it's gonna take back and, and store. And so, um, you know, much like the acorn woodpecker teaches us to keep those granaries up high, the squirrels a lot of times will keep their caches in stumps and things like that. Um, these squirrels work very hard uh, in the fall to get ready for the winter to ensure that, you know, their family and, 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 and their community will have enough to sustain them through the more harsh winter months. Okay, my people do the same thing. My family does the same thing. So these are lessons learned. You can see here, my family learns quite well. So this is my immediate family. This is four generations of us. Um, we are out harvesting acorns. We're out harvesting black oak acorns. Um, so this is something that my whole family participates in. It isn't that we send the women out to do the gathering and the men are out doing the hunting. Um, my family does it all. The men help gather and help prepare and, and cook. And, and my daughters and my wife are right beside us when we're, when we're hunting and fishing and uh, doing the things that we, that we enjoy doing. So this is us learning our lessons, okay? And I, guess a, and I guess a passing grade, if you will, for the test, you can see my granddaughter holding um, that perfect paper, that perfect essay. Um, she, she passed this test with uh, flying colors with acorn colors. And so I want to, before we go on to the next, to the next slide, I want you to 
try to reflect back on these. And as I talk about lessons learned, so all of the lessons that we learned about sustenance right here through our brothers and sisters, the, our animal brothers and sisters, all stems back to Koti Shoho. So Koti Shoho provides this sustenance, not just to us as humans, but to all, to all of our natural world and all of our, our family and community, because we, we believe that um, with, our, with our animal family. So we learn these lessons from them and Koti Shoho provides the background and, and the sustenance, um, not just to fill our bodies, but to fill our, fill our minds and to fill our spirituality um, lessons learned in sustenance from Koti Shoho. So Koti Shoho teaches us about territorial boundaries and how they prevent overcrowding. And so I remember when I first came to Pepperwood and uh, sat on the Native Advisory Council and we would go out through what people call oak woodlands. And, you know, our area here, we think we're blessed to be with oak and around oak woodlands. Um, but the way a lot of the, uh, the, the, the country, the territory looks now is not how it looked uh, when my people were um, able to, to care for the land and steward the land according to our traditions and our culture and the lessons that we learn, um, not only from our creator, from our ancestors, but from, from our partners in our natural environment so um, as we go through this next slide, this next few slides, we'll talk about territorial boundaries and how Koti Shoho helps us with that. So here you see a slide of a grove of black oaks and that people would look at that and initially it's very pleasing and it's, a, and it's beautiful and and I wouldn't argue with that. It's a beautiful photograph of a beautiful place, um, you know, and one would think, wow, look at all those black oaks. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And while the picture might be pleasing to the eye, um, that's not the best situation for those trees. And it's not the best situation for members of our community that depend on those trees for sustenance. So again, I know when a lot of people hear this for the first time and maybe an indigenous person would, would come to a preserve or a piece of property and say, you know what, pull out the chainsaws, we need to start thinning some of this stuff out. And people's initial reaction are, you know, usually not one of immediate embrace, embracing of that of that philosophy. But if you look at this beyond the eye-catching beauty of it, if you look at how high the canopies are for these trees because they're so crowded there, they have to grow really tall because they're searching for the sun. And in the pictures that you've seen earlier in the presentation and the one that I'm going to show you after this one, I want you to notice and remember if you can how wide those canopies were, okay? So this is, um, we're getting deep, right? This is a deep dive. So when you look at this photograph right here, you see trees that are basically constricted and they're not able to grow and expand and reach their full potential, okay? So that's what Koti Shoho teaches us. We need those boundaries. We need our space, okay? And that's the way, same way we are in our lives. People that are continuously suppressed, uh, my people know this, right? When you're suppressed for generations and generations, your world starts to close in on you and you're not able to expand and fully grow and fully develop and reach your full potential and your full strength for what you were put in this world to do. And so while this photograph looks good, those trees are suppressed and they're weak. 
So when high winds and storms come like that, those trees just get, just get wiped out because they don't have the strength to fight it off. And they will never produce acorns the same as they would if they were, if they were healthy, if they weren't so crowded and they were able to grow, expand and reach their full potential. So here you see in the background, this is a Koti Shoho, one where um, my family has gathered countless pounds of acorns for processing. And I want you to see this photograph is a little bit different than some of the ones you've seen at the beginning of the presentation. And you see that there are other trees around it. So we're, we're not saying that we need to live this life alone, far be it. We need the support of others. We need the support of our community. We need the support of our families. So there are other trees around this Koti Shohol, but they're not crowding it. They're not invading its space. They're, I think some of the young people are, maybe it's already passed, but I hear people talk about stay in your lane, you know? And so the trees around this Koti Shohol are doing that. And you can see how that canopy and how that tree is not 60 or 70 feet tall, but you can see how well rounded it is and how well and how good the shape of it is. You can also see that there are branches and limbs that are just off the ground, you know, so that comes all the way down. It makes it easier for those animals that aren't winged or that can't climb trees to ensure they're getting the very best and the freshest acorns as well. So it's not unusual for us to see deer eating acorns right off the trees. So when Koti Shohol is allowed to grow like this and fully expand and reach its full potential, not only is the tree more healthy, but the entire natural world is more, is more healthy when the tree has has um, space to reach its full potential, okay? And so I know this is probably hard for you folks to see. I'm looking at the TV up above me, which is a big screen. So sometimes it's easier for me to see, but basically this is a map of the Wapo territory and our neighbors. So we're talking about uh, Southern Wintoons, Putwins, um, Coast Miwok, uh, Southern Pomo, uh, central Pomo people. And if you could see this photograph a lot closer, there are some Wapo, uh, Wapo village sites within that pink or tan and the uh, color there. And you'll see that, you know, for the Western Wapo, Northern Wapo, Central Wapo, Southern Wapo, there's a lot of space between our villages. You know, we're not all crowded up into one space. And so this is what we learn from Koti Shoho, when we observe those territorial boundaries, and I just don't mean just from one tribe to another, but I mean from the smaller communities. So we stay in our lane. That's something we've always done. Uh, Koti Shoho was divided by certain families. So certain families would have designated trees where they gathered from all the time and other people wouldn't encroach or infringe on that. And this is something that we as Indian people, we carry on that teaching today. So even like for basket weaving or something, if I was gonna go over into, into Putwin territory, because I seen some good material over there that's easy for me to gather, I wouldn't just go do that because that's, that's not appropriate. And that's not the way we was taught to respect one another. Uh, and respect those territorial boundaries. So I would have to get permission from, from a Putwin person before I was able to go gather there or Miwok or Pomo or, or wherever we are. So we see how Koti Shoho grows and how it thrives. And so when we set up our communities and our villages, we do that same thing where we give ourselves some space and some room so we're not all depleting the same resource. Um, okay, rest and regeneration. So allowing time for our natural world to replenish itself promotes bountiful harvests for years to come. 
And so I hope what we're able to do as we go th through our visit here today is my, my, my goal is to try and, and intertwine and tie all of this together to give you just a glimpse of why this tree is so, is so special uh, to my people. So in, in today's busy world and in our lives today, um, you know, well, I don't know if maybe with the, the virus and things going on, people have more time at home, but I don't know that it's restful time at home. Perhaps the first couple of weeks were, but after that, not so much. But rest and regeneration is really important to us and to, to everybody. It's not just to the indigenous community. Everybody needs to rest and regenerate, uh, you know, re regenerate themselves. And so we have certain ceremonies during the year um, that do that uh, in the springtime when, the, when our world is coming out of sleep and rest and regeneration time, which is what we call winter time. Um, and so we have to, uh, sometimes it's tough love. These lessons are not always easy. So kind of like I talked about respecting territorial boundaries, the plants and, and, and animal communities have territorial boundaries as well. So if we went to the same fishing spot every day or every time we wanted fish, we would go to the same spot. At some point when we went back there, those fish wouldn't be there. You know, if we hunted the same area continuously and that's the only place we hunted, at some point there wouldn't be any deer left there, okay? Our basketry plants are the same way. So if we go gather sedge root at the same place every time we go, we're not giving a chance for those roots and for those plants to regenerate themselves to provide us with the material we need. But a lot of those plants will do their best to keep producing year after year after year. And so uh, sometimes it's a hard lesson for us to learn. But Koti Shoho helps teach us this lesson of letting things rest and regenerate and rejuvenate themselves. Koti Shoho does this by only producing acorns every other year. So this is not a tree. You can see, I don't know if it's on your left or on your right, it's probably on your left. You'll see a tree, uh, again, one of the ones that my family uh, has been gathering acorns for for, for generations. Um, that's just loaded with acorns. And then you see the tree on an off year. There are no acorns on that tree. So we do not go back to the same tree every year and just continue to strip the tree, strip the tree. Well, what about the trees that do stuff like that? Can you do it? Yes, you can. But this is why Koti Shohol is so important to us because it's a constant reminder, you know, to allow our natural environment, to allow the plant and animal species and societies, even if they produce every year, it doesn't mean that you just go and get greedy and, and, and gather everything and just continually strip a plant, strip a plant, strip a plant. Um, so this is how Koti Shoho teaches us that restraint and keeps reminding us, uh, you know, to be careful and to be respectful and to be mindful um, of the resources that we use and how we use them and how we, uh, how we how we care for them, how will we respect them? So, I'd like to move on to respect and reciprocity. And so, we this photo here shows um, the Native Advisory Council at Pepperwood. Um, so that's that's my wife. Um, would be on the far left, I guess. Uh, Lucy, then me, a uh, very dear friend of ours, Ben Benson, uh, Christy Gabaldon, L. Frank, and Dr. Brenda Flies with Hawks. So um, this group of wonderful, good-hearted, um, highly knowledgeable people um, 
when it comes to not only Western academics, but uh, more important to me, indigenous knowledge, uh, there, is a, there is a wealth of knowledge carried um, within the folks that you see here in this picture. And so the, the council is an advisory council, but the thing that uh, makes us feel good about the work that we do is that Pepperwood is probably the first, I'm gonna call it outside, meaning non-indigenous agency or group that I have worked with that, um, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 an, I'm an outspoken Indian, but that is not looking for a token, is not looking for an indigenous person to hold up and say, ooh, look what we have, okay? Uh, Pepperwood takes to heart what the Native Advisory Council and what indigenous, the indigenous perspective is. And they're actively engaging with the council the council is actively engaged in the stewardship practices throughout Pepperwood. And so it's really a unique bond that the council has with Pepperwood. And of course, I was fortunate and, and I'm honored that Pepperwood seen fit to, um, to hire me as their indigenous education coordinator. So one of the main projects that we're working on as the Native Advisory Council um, it's called the Black Oak Project. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Get through here. So <clears throat> basically what the Black Oak Project is, uh, we received funding from a very, very supportive donor. I don't know if I should say it. Uh, th through the, through the, um, through the gener generous donations and support of the Christensen Fund um, has funded what we call the Black Oak Project. Koti Shohol project. And so what we what the project is, is we've gone through Pepperwood Preserve and we've identified 60 what we call specimen black oak trees. Um, ones that you've seen in the earlier photographs, some of them of trees that are healthy and strong and doing well. And we looked at the micro environment of those trees that are so so healthy and doing so well and, and just, you know, producing uh, crop after crop of acorns every other year. And we said, you know, how can we promote other, other black oaks within Pepperwood to try and steward the land and help them as best we can? So the idea was to identify the specimen black oaks figure out what the micro environment was, why they're doing so well, and try to replicate that environment on a small scale to other selective black oaks. And what does that stewardship practice look like? So we're talking about removing invasive species. We're talking about doing micro burns and using fire. Uh, fire not only um, helps with the, uh, with the invasive species, fire also, um, uh, helps protect Koti Shoho from sudden oak death syndrome and the virus that that that, it, that that carries and how it transfers. And black oaks are, are highly susceptible to that. And so fire helps us uh, um, combat that. So here is, this isn't really bad, but, uh, but I'm sure you're going to be able to see the difference. So Pepperwood also um, has a forest thinning project that we do and it goes hand in hand with our black oak project. So here's here's a, a section of a place on on Pepperwood before we did the forest thinning. And the next slide. This shows what this is that same area after we went through and done the initial forest thinning. So you can see the piles in the background there that will be burned. Uh, but you've seen a lot of the invasive species, the brush, some poison oak, uh, some of the conifers, some firs that have been removed. And so this is the initial step to try and give Koti Shoho a little bit of breathing room, give them some space, um, you know, and we can always come back and identify the trees that we think, um, you know, we can help even more, we can steward them even more. And that may actually mean removal of some of the um, surrounding oaks. 
but you can see these these trees um, do have some decent structure to them. The canopies are not overly tall and that's because they're younger trees. So um, we can help steward and help shape the future of these trees through the Black Oak Project, through Pepperwood's Forest Thinning Project. And um, you know this is the best way that we can help steward and support Koti Shoho. So, um, before I move on to, to the last slide, or maybe I should go ahead and, yeah, anyway, I just, this, this is, is, again, is a tremendous step uh, because for most other preserves and agencies and even for large uh, private property holders, um, when you start talking about coming in and doing this to their, to their property, um, their, their initial reaction is not, is not usually favorable. Uh, but again, the fact that Pepperwood embraces this, encourages this, supports this mindset and this, this indigenous stewardship philosophy um, has, has, has really helped our relationship, uh, my people beyond the council and the relationship with Pepperwood grow and thrive, which is exactly what we hope to help Koti Shoho do. And so my last slide here, um, I like to call rooted in tradition. Uh, this is a lesson that uh, Koti Shoho um, teaches us. And so this is another um, Koti Shoho that uh, has been supplying my family, my community, um, our animal community and our animal families as well, literally for centuries. So that is one, that is one Koti Shoho right there. And my entire immediate family, four generations of us are standing in front of one tree. And as old as that tree is and as ancient as that tree is, uh, that tree is very healthy. It's in wonderful shape produces tons of acorns and um, it's just uh, it's just a very very special tree and a very special teacher. So I think um, our time is uh, coming to a close for my presentation um, and I, I think we'll have some Q&A here afterwards but I just hope that through this presentation um, you have gotten a glimpse of what a tree that people see every day and think of it as pretty or uh, think of it as wonderful burning firewood or however people think when they look at, at oak trees. Um, I hope that I've been able to provide you a little different look um, and insight into, into our world and what we see when we look at that Koti Shoho and why we hold these trees in such reverence and why they hold such a special place in our heart, in our lives, and in our history. Um, they truly are teachers and, um, you know, they're not our only teacher. Our, our natural world is filled with, in, with teachers. And I think the reason why we're able to connect so fully and so deeply with them is we understand that our environment and the animals teach us. So people ask me all the time how we keep that, what, how, what do you mean respect and reciprocity and how that feels? And I like to say, we know our place. And so you, throughout this whole presentation, you've never heard me say land management practices one time. Uh, the first place, we're not able to, we're humans. We see with the fires, we see with our environment we see with global warming, when we think we're able to manage something, we fall woefully short. And in the second place, you know, we don't put ourselves above the animals or the natural world. They were here long before we were, we were here. So we have a lot to learn from them. We don't place ourselves at the top of the food chain, but we readily acknowledge our place and our responsibility to help try to keep our natural world in balance. Thank you.
Thank you, Clint. That was wonderful. Uh, and we definitely have uh, quite a few questions that have come in here. So I'd love to um, direct some of those to you. Uh, let's start with this one here. Um, how do you balance wanting uh, branches that are close to the ground for the animal community with the risk of fire danger and the need to limb up? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And my, my, my response to that, we, I talk about this in, in my fire presentations as well. How we balance that is through fire and we balance that through burning. So when those devastating fires came through Pepperwood, we had a, a burn plan, um, you know, already set to go. And when the devastating fires came through, uh, you know, Pepperwood, some of the staff reached out to me and said, what do we do now? And I said, we burn. So cultural burns take place low and slow. And we burn sometimes more than once in a year. So if we go through and we're routinely burning the areas underneath our, 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 uh, our oak trees, that fuel never gets really high. We keep that, those grasses burned off. We keep the fallen limbs and things um, cleaned up, cleared out. So most cultural burns, if we're gonna burn a grassland or if we're gonna burn underneath our, our oaks, um, literally, I wish I had a, a, a one of my fire slides here, but the flames rarely get more than a foot high. We call cultural burns low and slow. So the way we try to protect and keep those devastating fires out and away from these trees is by using fire, it, culturally. Excellent. Um, and I guess on that same note, uh, when a black oak grove is thinned, and, and that space is made, uh, will the remaining trees take on a wider profile over time? Yes. So again, um, I only had time for so many slides here, but where the, where the thinning practices take place uh, in the Black Oak Project and in Pepperwood's thinning project, um, it doesn't take long at all. And even sometimes when we thin those tree, a certain tree back, it immediately will shoot out sprouts. So as soon as this, the, uh, you, you thin the other trees and that brush out and the sunlight is able to come in and uh, reach more parts of that tree, you'll see that tree start to sprout new branches and new things at a much lower level. And again, once those new sprouts start, they're not gonna be reaching straight up trying to find the sun, but they're gonna take their natural course of growth, which is to branch out. So yes, they will rejuvenate and reshape themselves if we're able to help, um, help, help them along in that process. So the next, uh, the, the next questions are a couple of questions that are related to the same concept. Um, which is referring to non-native and invasive species on the landscape. Um, how have native people made use of them, if at all? Uh, have you managed to keep them off the land that you tend to? And um, is there a certain term that just refers to them being foreign or are there descriptive terms of their influence on the landscape to describe them? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a... Ooh, what a question. I don't know that I'm going to remember. I don't know that I can I'm... break it up too if you want to start. The first question is mainly um, uh, how non native, non native and invasive species on the landscape, how have native peoples made use of them, if at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I can't speak to all native peoples, um, but I can speak to myself and my, my family, my community here. And it's um, very, very little um, as far as us making use of them. Um, I do also want to clarify, though, that sometimes uh, an invasive species can be native. Uh, so the fact that a species is invasive doesn't mean that, that it's non-native. So, um, and how we deal with even native species is with removal. So. Um, we do hold all plants and animals in high regard, 
but in the middle of a sedge bed or in the middle of, of, a, of an oak grove or underneath a, you know, one of these majestic Koti show holes, it, it, every plant has its place, but every place is not for every plant. So we work hard to um, identify certain sections, certain areas, certain situations where we try to keep out native and non-native invasive species as well. And for me, uh, the way I live my life as cultural and traditional as I possibly can, there's not a lot of room for non-native um, invasive species because they're taking away uh, not only space, but nutrients and things from, from the plants and, and animals that, that I need in order, in order for my culture to survive. So then the second part of that question was, um, how are they referred to in your native language? Do you have a certain term that refers to these like invasive species or non-native species? Coco and Nia. Um, no, and I think the way, the way we do it, um, I don't have no terminology uh, for plants that, that aren't native plants or that aren't to me. So I guess uh, the way that we deal with it, this is going to sound awfully westernized, but um, we don't we don't acknowledge we don't acknowledge them. So if it's like yellow star thistle or something like that, you know, I would we would just say sticker or pokey or something, but. I'm not going to acknowledge the existence of yellow star thistle by trying to make a word in my language that says yellow star thistle. Mm -hmm. We don't want to legitimize it, I guess you'd say. Another question here, uh, for young oaks that are marked to be cut down, what do you do with the wood that comes from them? Mm -hmm. We burn it. We burn it or we use it for, for shelter. Sometimes we make uh, shelters, whether it's um, uh, dressing, dressing houses for our, for our dancers to dance. Um, I'm, a big, I'm a big time smoker. Uh, I don't mean smoke in puff puff, I mean smoke in meat. So I use that sometimes. We'll split it and we uh, use it to make our uh, smoke houses and things like that. So um, nothing, nothing goes, goes to waste. We don't cut it down just to cut it down. There are many, many uses for, that, for the wood that we, that we take down. Now, this is a question that a couple people had um, and I feel like could be a, probably a whole nother presentation. Um, but could you share a little bit about acorn processing or acorn eating in your traditions? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's a whole nother, you know, we talked about doing that at Pepperwood for the last couple of years and maybe we'll do it. Um, yeah, so I, it is a whole different presentation, but I'll try to make it just as, as quick as I can. So um, we like to gather the acorns, uh, like I said, right off the tree or the freshly dropped acorns. Um, so we gather them, uh, we store them. Some people store them in the shell. Uh, I like, to, my family processes them right away. So we, we crack, the, the, crack them, open them up. Then you have to let, let them dry most of the time. If I could turn my camera around, actually you would see right by my wood stove right now, uh, I have a, I have a table set up and I'm actually drying some acorns right now. Um, but so we, let, so we let them dry and then the husks and stuff come off. Uh, you, most of them will come off when we'll go outside and use a, what we call winnowing basket to get the, the stuff gone. Um, then we go ahead and pound it up. Uh, we grind it and when we store it with the grinding rocker, sometimes you can use electronic device, but it better be a good one or it'll, it'll tear them up because those nuts get so hard. Um, but we grind ours, store it that way. And then when we get ready to use them, we pull them out and we leach them. So it's a matter of making whatever 
container or whatever process you need to do again that it, it this could be a whole nother series thing um, anyway we leach it um, and then we cook it and however much water if any you put into it is is how thick you want it so if you're going to make bread or something you make an acorn bread it's very little moisture that you put in it and we and we make our bread uh, then it's mush you add a little bit more water and it becomes like a thick almost like an oatmeal and sometimes the way I like it is a little bit thinner than that. And so we just, it all depends on how much water you add and, and you boil it up just like you would mush. And I like mine thin enough so that I can just, I just drink it. That's my favorite way to have it. So pick it, dry it, grind it, store it, leach it, cook it, enjoy it. Nicely done with wrapping that whole whole culture into a short little answer there. Um, uh, another question here, are there any understory plants um, that are traditionally encouraged to grow with goti shoho? That we would want plants to grow under Yeah, understory plants that you would encourage to grow uh, around black oaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't and we don't because we, uh, because the ones that we use that we're gonna gather the acorns for. So when I talked earlier about burning, it's really hard to, um, even like younger oaks, you know, when the oaks fall and, and new seedlings may sprout up underneath a larger tree. Um, we, sometimes we'll try to move them, but usually when, an, when a koti shohol is on its way out, um, like when it's almost to the end of its life, then, it, it starts to drop enormous amounts of acorns to you know, make sure that it, it's, it carries on. And so when that happens and we see those little seedlings come up, then we'll identify a certain number of those. And when we burn underneath that tree, we make sure that those stay protected. And you know, other plants, we just don't do it. And so sometimes we'll go in and we'll burn late summer, uh, late summer, very early fall before the acorns even start to drop. And so we do that so that we make sure when the acorns drop, it's easy to pick up and we're not trying to dig through a foot high or 18 inches of grass trying to find some of those acorns that drop or that we or that we knock off. So um, we like to keep it pretty clean underneath Koti Shoho. Mm -hmm. Here is a question um, about the every other year production of acorns. Um, how synchronous are all the trees in an area? In other words, are all of the trees most productive in the same years and other years they're relatively rare or does it vary from tree to tree? Yeah, so for, for in, in my experience, it varies from, from tree to tree. And so that's why we have, you know, it isn't like uh, one year in Sonoma County, you know, we're not gonna have any any uh, acorns from black oak. It isn't that, it's like, it's like tree to tree. So that's why we have several, several trees that we, that have been like allotted, if you wanna say, uh, is where my family goes to gather, gather a lot. So it's all within our, within our territorial boundaries, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's on a tree, case by case, tree by tree, uh, basis for, for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here. This is one pertaining to um, burning. So what would you say are the benefits of burning the thinnings in the place where they are versus taking them away to be bur burned elsewhere? For example, does burning in place help enrich the soil? The reason I ask is I've been hearing a lot about forest debris from thinning or fuel load reduction um, being used to burn for biomass incineration to make electricity. It seems problematic for different reasons. I wondered about your perspective on this. Yeah, actually, um, again, a, a fantastic question and, and you, um, you answered it in the very first part. You answered your own question probably in the same way I would. Um, because of what it does for the soil, replenish, rejuvenate the soil. And, um, you know, 
maybe it's the Indian in me, I guess, but uh, that's it. That is its place. And I think um, that's, that's where it belongs. So I'm, I'm really big. I'm a huge supporter on, on burning them in place. Uh, it doesn't mean where they fall. You can see in the pictures that we make our piles and things like that. But after we make those piles and burn the piles, we still like to come back and burn the understory as well. So I think they belong where they are. And um, I'm a big proponent of, of burning in place. Um, there are a lot of other ways to make to make electricity. And um, I don't know, if you ask my personal perspective, we need to reduce some of that anyway, so. All right, we've got one more question here. Um, this one says, what would you say to non-native people interested in eating acorns in terms of how to honor them and all the original people here? I've been gathering a small amount of acorns every year from trees that are overflowing. Um, I know I come from acorn eating culture way back, but I'm concerned about my role as a white person here on land that was not originally mine. However, it seems important to honor these fruits of the land that offer themselves as sustenance in part by eating them. Mm -hmm. what, a, what, a, what a question. Um, hmm. Well, I guess what I would suggest is that you sign up for a class at Pepperwood when we do acorn processing. <laughs> uh, no, this, that's, that's a question that goes far beyond acorns. And uh, I, 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 I will be honest with you in that people that learn from an indigenous person and who tries to carry that respect in the right way, um, it's good. And we, we appreciate that. Um, we always, I guess what puts us off is when people take that knowledge and present it as their own, or they start teaching it and, uh, you know, making like it comes from them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's really important to Indigenous people that we tell our own story and that the culture that is ours remain ours. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not willing to share that with people. I'm here trying to share, the, you know, a little bit of, of, of what Koti Shoho means to my people. But then when we start seeing that on websites and people are given classes to teach what they learned from indigenous people and they're not indigenous themselves, um, that doesn't help our, our relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people. So, um, you know, we realize that we are not the only acorn eating society, but if you're going to partake of the acorn according to the ways of my people um, do that with reverence and respect. If people want to process and use the acorns the way that their ancestors did, then that really doesn't matter what I think. You know, I don't, it's not my place to hold judgment on that. So I would say when an opportunity comes to learn and participate firsthand with an indigenous person, do it. And if they're willing to share that information and those ways with you and you're doing it with a good heart and in a good way, um, then that's okay. That's good because they shared that with you. But make sure they're sharing it with you and you're not, and it's not perceived as you taking it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clint. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's, those are all the questions that we've had come in at this point. I do also want to mention there's been lots of thank yous for such a wonderful presentation in the chat. And I'll make sure you get a copy of what's in the chat here so you can read through that at your leisure. Um, and I will just take a moment to wrap up with a couple of closing slides. And during that time, if anyone has further questions, you can feel free to continue to add those in the chat. And we still have a few more minutes to, um, uh, Clint could still address some questions. So I'll just take a moment here to share with you all some upcoming events that we have planned. Um, Clint will be sharing with us um, further insights uh, in another webinar next month on the 18th. Uh, insights into Pomo and Wapo basketry. So that's another, will be another great opportunity to learn with Clint. 
Um, and then February 20th, if all goes well and we're able to gather in person, we will be having a field exploration on lichens featuring Jesse Miller. And then on March 18th, we will be hopefully able to gather in person and Clint will be leading a hike um, centered around uh, the topic of plants used by Pomo and Wapo people. So all of these events you can register for on our website at pepperwoodpreserve.org. And space is very limited for the in-person events since we must gather in small groups. So uh, we will start a wait list if you find that it's full when you log in to register. And I'll just check here to see if we've got any questions. A lot of gratitude and appreciation coming your way, Clint, from our participants today. Thank you. And I also invite everyone to um, you know, stay in touch with us. Uh, as I mentioned, our website you, is where you can register for upcoming events. And you can follow along with us on social media to hear about um, our various projects and work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And our YouTube channel is where you will find the recording of this presentation as well as others. Um, quite a few people expressed interest um, in learning more about uh, cultural burning and Clint did give a presentation on that which you can find on our YouTube channel at uh, Pepperwood Foundation on YouTube. All right and it looks like with that just more thank yous coming in in the chat and again I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank thank you Clint for spending the time to share so much wonderful information with us all today. Thank you. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hang out for another moment here, just in case any other questions come in. Okay, well, let me, I'm, you want to say that? Okay, so it's, oh, are we done? Go ahead. Okay, so it, it's important for us to acknowledge, and it's hard for me because I can't see uh, who the participants are, but um, when our people take the time to support us like this, um, it means a lot to us. And Lucy's reminding me that a very dear friend of ours, uh, uh, we think Pam joined us today, so if she did, we just want to thank her for that um, support and much love and respect going out to our to our uh, Putwin family, Wintoon family. Wonderful. All right, so at this, I will wrap things up. Uh, once again, gratitude and thank you to you, Clint, and to everyone who joined us here today. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. Take care.